Hey everyone, Almighty Zen Taco here, and today we're going to be learning how to make a 3D menu for your games. So let me show you what I'm talking about. We're going to go ahead and run this right now. So we got this menu, we can press left or right, and the menu will scale the different menu elements, and uh, then you can select one, which I haven't implemented yet. But as you see, it's, it's kind of 3D, they get bigger as they're closer to the front of the frame, and as they're further away, they get smaller. So it creates a nice 3D effect. And we can modify this in lots, lots of different ways, which I will show you some of them, I think. Maybe not, we'll see. This is gonna be really complicated though, so I apologize in advance. Uh, try to stay with me, I will do my best to, as thoroughly as I can, explain how this works. All right, here we go. All right, so on our new frame, what we need to make this work, first we need an active object. Drop one in. Now we need another active object. Drop it in. All right, the first one is going to be called center point. And what this is, is nothing more than the center point of our menu. So we're going to uh, be able to move this around, and wherever we drop this, this is going to be the very center of our menu. We don't want to be able to see this in our application, though, so make sure you go to the properties and uncheck visible at start. Now this next one here, this is going to be our element. This is our menu element. So this is going to be the different things that you can select in your menu. Let's go ahead and make this into something a little different, just like a box or something, just so we can see it on the screen and tell that it is different from our center point. So this we do want to be able to see. <clears throat> All right, so this is going to need some variables. So let's give it an, a variable called ID. We're going to need two more. We're going to need current time and then target time. Uh, we need an amp value. Uh, we're going we're gonna to put a speed value in here, SPD. And we also need a scaler. OK, so the first thing we're going to do is essentially, this is going to be a sine wave movement. Um, we're going to make this move around the center point using a sine wave formula. And then we're going to also change the scale based on where it's at within the circle. So honestly, it's not that complicated of a concept, but it is a little math heavy. So we're going to go ahead and do a start a frame event. And what we're going to do is we need to spread the IDs for this object. So go to alterable values, spread value zero in ID. All right, so we're going to go ahead and set up an always event. Now I'm going to have to modify this a few times. Um, I'm just going to do this step by step to uh, kind of show how this works. So first thing, we're going to go and try to set this up how we would normally have it move around a circle in a sine wave. So that would be, we're going to set the position, the X coordinate of this element, and we're going to set it to the X coordinate of this object here, the center position object, plus sine. And now we need, normally it would be timer, uh, and then we would divide it by a number <clears throat> and then we multiply it by another number. Okay, so this last number here, this is the amp value. This timer, right here at default, the way that I would do this would be to put timer in here. And what timer is, is essentially keeps track of how long your app has been running. So that would make sure that this sine wave was graphed linearly over time. And this is just the speed value, this two, that determines how quickly it's gonna do that. It's gonna move, uh, it's gonna graph the wave. <clears throat> so. We need to edit all this though. So we want sine of timer. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab the value of, under our menu elements, we're gonna grab the value of current time. Okay? Now we want current time to be divided by the speed value. Let's grab the value of speed. And we wanna put a parentheses. Uh, we're gonna multiply this whole thing by the value of amp. So grab amp. Now, right now, these are all zero, so this will not work at the moment. But we can go in here to our menu element and add some value. So normally, if we, let's replace something real quick. If I replace current time with timer, and then we'll modify some stuff in our menu element, we're gonna make sure that, uh, let's see, we'll make amp, this is how, this is the amplitude of the wave, so we're gonna make amp something like 200 and we'll make the speed one. If we run this, it is moving left and right in a sine wave, okay? 
So that is, it is functioning. We do know that it is functioning properly, but uh, we don't want this to be, we don't want to use timer for this. We want to use current time. So let's grab the value of current time, throw it back in there. Okay, so the reason we're using current time and we have a value called target time is because we want you to be able to, by pressing buttons like left and right on the keyboard, to smoothly transition the position of this object. All right, so we're gonna do it this way. We're gonna say the keyboard upon pressing a key, right arrow, we are going to um, add to current time. Sorry, we're gonna add to target time 360. Okay, now we want to tween this here using the tween formula. So let's, that's gonna be on our always event. <clears throat> so what we're gonna do is always set the alterable value of current time to the value of current time plus parentheses, the value of target time minus the value of current time parentheses times 0 0.1, which is our modifying number. Um, and this is a tween. I've explained this before, but essentially what this does is you get the difference between these two and you are uh, taking a fraction of that, which is here, it's a 10th, and then you're moving it. So as it, it'll move, what happens is current time is going to try to get to target time and it's going to do it so in such that the further it is away from that value the faster it will move towards it the closer it is the slower that way it smoothly transitions so this is our tween for current time <clears throat> all right let's go ahead and take a look at it okay by pressing it now i'm adding 360 and so it's it's going the whole way it's it's uh, graphing the entire uh, amplitude of the wave up and down, uh, but it does work. So this this is exactly what we want. Now, the thing is, if we copy these, throw some in here, and run it, you will see that they are all stacked on top of each other. So we need to make sure that doesn't happen. We need to spread these out. <clears throat> okay, so now we want to make sure that these objects are evenly spaced out. Um, so to do that, what we're going to do is on the start of event, start a frame event, we want to set the alterable value of uh, target time to 360 times and grab the value of ID from this object. And this will make sure that they're evenly distributed. Okay. Now we need to do one more thing. Uh, we have the value of speed, which we have not set. Now the speed of this is going to need to be dependent on it's going to need to change based on how many objects you have in the menu and so we're just going to set that to be the value of those objects the number of objects so go to alter value set and we're going to set the speed value go to the menu element select count and then number of objects now if we run this we should see that it evenly distributes them now it's not moving on the y-axis but this does work okay <clears throat> so now we want to uh, make it circle on the y-axis. So that's over here. We're going to set up the y position. So position, y coordinate, and we're going to set that to be the y coordinate of our center object plus cosine. And we're going to pretty much copy the rest of the formula as we did above. So that is going to be um, grab the value of where to go. Okay, there it is. Grab uh, current time divided by the value of speed. Multiply by amp. Don't forget that close bracket or close parenthesis. Okay, so this should work. Let's take a look at it. <clears throat> okay, so now we have a menu. So if you want a circle menu, you're done. Pretty much. Uh, the only thing left to do is to find out which current ID object is in front, and uh, we're going to do that last. But uh, we do have a circle menu. So all we got to do now is affect the scale. So we're going to do that by always setting the scale to the value of scalar. 
We're gonna do one for maximum quality. And we are always gonna set the value of scalar <clears throat> to the difference between the menu element and the center point on the y-axis. That way, you know, we if it's above, it'll be a higher number. If it's closer to us, if it's further away, it'll be smaller. And then we're gonna multiply that by a fraction to shrink it down because a scalar needs to be uh, less than one or one because, or even greater, but one is full size. So we wanna keep it relatively small. If it's something like in the hundreds, it's gonna be huge. So we're gonna set scalar to be the value of, get the, get the y-coordinate of the menu element subtract the y coordinate of the center, put all of this in parentheses and multiply by 0 0.1. I think that's right, let's find out. Whoa, what did I do? Let's make it 0 0.01. Okay, that works perfect. The only problem is, as you can see, it disappears. And that's because with this formula, it can be less than zero. And we don't want that. So all we're gonna do is apply what I call a clamp. So go back to where we set the scalar value. All right, so we just wanna make sure that this is clamped. To clamp this value, we want to get the max of, and what max does is it give you the max of two values. So put a parentheses. The first value is going to be uh, what the formula, the scalar formula gives us. And if that ever goes below a number, we wanna make sure we get the max of these two numbers. So we'll say like 0 0.2, close parentheses. What this means is essentially, it's either gonna, if um, if the, the formula for the scalar ever gets below 0 0.2, this is just gonna return 0 0.2. Let's take a look now. Okay, so that works pretty well. But as you'd notice, it's still perfectly circular. So we need to scrunch this in on the y-axis, axis. So scrunching it on the y-axis is actually really easy. Um, since we know that amp is what controls the wavelength of our sine wave, we just need to shrink amp. So we're gonna take the amp value um, and we are going to put parentheses around it. And inside this little space here, we're gonna multiply this by, I don't know, like 0 0.5. We'll see if that works. I think I want that a little more scrunched. So we'll say uh, 0 0.8. No, wait, that's less scrunched. Sorry, 0 0.2. Okay, that's pretty scrunchy, but also we have shrunk our uh, the size of our objects. And that's because the formula for controlling the size of these objects uh, on, on the menu is based on the difference between the uh, center point and, and the object itself. So we can fix that really simply here by going into where we control the scalar. Um, instead of something small like 0 0.01, we were multiplying it by, we're gonna multiply it by something like 0 0.1, giving us a larger picture. And that one's not too bad. It might be a little little big. Let's throw some more menu elements in here and see what it looks like. We're just gonna copy these. Um, I think it should be something a little smaller than 0 0.1. We'll make it 0 0.05. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, we forgot to do this here. Let's go ahead and copy this event with the right arrow. Make it the left arrow. And uh, all we gotta do is add a negative 360 to this value. And now we can scale left too by pressing the left. So now the menu is fully functional in that way. <clears throat> all right, so now we just need to figure out which object is in front. <clears throat> so how are we gonna do that? All right, so we're gonna go ahead and create an object. Gonna stick this object right here. And I'm gonna call this menu selector. This does not need to be visible. <clears throat> Let's insert a counter just so we can see what's going on.
Okay, so we want to find out which uh, menu object is current. So what we're going to do is find out if this object, the menu object, is overlapping the menu selector. When that happens, we are going to set the counter to the value of ID. So let's go ahead and see if that works. Let's make that thing visible at start. Okay, so it's not touching. We need to make sure that this is lined up with our menu. Okay, it is. So that's that's number zero, one, two. So now we have different menu elements selected. So from here on out, it's really easy. Uh, make this thing invisible. Obviously, you don't want to see that. And here's the point uh, where you would be doing what you want to do with the menu. So all you'd have to do is say, um, actually here, we'll do it this way. <clears throat> Give this menu selector an alterable value. And we're gonna call it current selection, okay? So instead of this counter, we can leave that there, but what we're gonna do is set it so that the alterable value of current selection is the value of ID from the menu element. So let's say, now we're gonna do stuff. Let's say we press the enter, the keyboard, I'm pressing a key, enter, and the value, where's that? <clears throat> the value of current selection equals like zero. When that happens, let's play a sample. Okay, I'm gonna make a couple of these. So that's current selection one. If you keep changing the value of current selection to different stuff, that'll uh, that'll do different stuff whenever different things are selected. So I'm just gonna have it play a different sound effect for every single selection when you press enter. That way we can check to see if it's working. And this is just some sound effects I have from a different project I'm currently working on. Now, I, keep in mind, I don't have uh, every single menu object set up yet. I just have five of them. All right, here we go. Okay. So as you see, uh, this works. It's a perfectly functional 3D menu. And so uh, what you would probably wanna do then is change uh, the art for each of these to a different picture. And you could do that by something as simple as uh, creating one animation. Here's how, how I would do that. I would create one animation. Since these are all the same object, I would take this first animation um, and I would make a different bunch of different pictures for it. And then I would always set the uh, animation value to its ID. Here, I'll just, I'll do it right now. We'll give them different colors. And we just do that start a frame. We would say animation, change uh, animation frame and get the value of ID. And as long as the ID is spread first, they should all be different now. Boom. All right, guys, so that's how you make a snazzy 3D menu for Click Team Fusion 2.5. I know this one was kind of math heavy, so I hope it wasn't that hard. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below, and I will try to get back to you guys. Or you can hop into my Discord channel and ask me or someone else, and we'll try to explain this for you. Um, yep, so I hope it wasn't too painful. And as always, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Cheers.